All right, I have one hour, so I'm going to be moving at a fairly fast pace. And what I'm going to show you is pretty similar to presentations I gave in 2010 and then slightly updated in 2018. So I'm going to ad lib the corrections as we go, and I'm going to provide background as well uh, that I think will be helpful. A lot of people get confused in the subject. Let me just ask quickly, am I too loud for all of you, or is it good? No, it's good. Uh, okay. So, the subject of the Antichrist, what does the word mean, and is there more than one? I'm going to bring that up because I recently did uh, an interview that's moving pretty quickly on the internet, and I've been kind of surprised by some of the comments. Under that, there seems to be a common set of objections that show up, and one of those is people think that there's either no Antichrist who's a human being, or there are many Antichrists, and not a person who is the Antichrist, and every kind of confusion in between, in including confusion on, you know, as I've said here before in past presentations, the day would come when people would say this can't be the Antichrist because we're still here, or this can't be the mark of the beast because we're still here, because they're so convinced by a particular scenario for the last days, whether it be pre-tribulationism or mid-tribulationism, or amillennialism or post-millennialism, or post-millennial post-tribulationism, which is actually where most so-called post-tribulationists reside today, which is just as wrong as the other scenarios I just mentioned. And even something called pre-wrath rapturism, which is under the sixth seal of the apocalypse and sits somewhere between uh, mid-tribulationism and post-tribulationism. That also is incorrect. So tonight, uh, I'll have an opportunity, I believe, to show you a couple of examples from scripture of how you can precisely pin down the actual timing of the Lord's return. I have presented that here before, um, at least twice, maybe three times, uh, material titled The Real Rapture, which is uh, a small amount of the material in a volume that includes that as a subtitle in my upcoming Messiah History in the Tribulation Period series. One thing I have realized uh, since 1987, and I'd say especially in the last 15 years or so, is that when we look at the seals of the apocalypse and the first four deal with the, first, uh, with the four horsemen, and that's going to be the topic of the discussion this morning, is quite often we think, and, and I was guilty of this too, that as soon as those individuals were identified, they would also be writing. In other words, their identification by someone in the church when the time came. And then their actual activity, the fulfillment, in other words, the, the action that occurs uh, with them writing under that particular seal to which they pertain, that those things would coincide. However, as you know, and as lots of people around the world know at this point, I've known the identity of the Antichrist, the fourth horseman of the apocalypse since 1987. There have been a few people who knew before that they suspected they didn't have the hard evidence that, that I have, you know, that I've had since then. One person had some of it, that's Monty Judah, Messianic pastor who is in uh, Oklahoma. Was in Colorado Springs, someone I met while I was still a cadet at the Air Force Academy in uh, 1987, I'd say early 1987 I think is when I met him, but it would have been late 86 or early 87. November of 1986 is when I became a believer you know, I was a secular Jew, I was an agnostic, but I told people I was an atheist and I really didn't know the difference in the definitions. It was, uh, it was embarrassing, right? I was anything but a theologian, anything but a historian. These were like the driest, most awful subjects I could imagine ever being interested in. And that's the truth. You know, just like in high school, I would, uh, uh, I would dread the notion of writing anything longer than two or three pages. I would further dread, like almost I want to die dread, having to speak in front of a small group of people. Five or six, and, and I'm toast at that point. <laughs> Forget it. You know, and that continued uh, when I was at the academy. It wasn't until I became a believer that just God flipped something in me. And now it's hard to write two or three pages instead of three or four or 500. <laughs> I struggle with that, and that's not a joke. I've written thousands of pages at this point, you know, in dozens of books that are coming, most of which I worked on for more than a decade, each of them individually. So uh, 
the challenges have been flipped on their heads and some things in me have been, but what I want to point out is biblically there are many antichrists, and I'm going to define that term from scripture for you, but additionally, in terms of these four horsemen of the apocalypse, another error that people make is that they're the same person, you know, going through different phases sometimes. Others will say that the antichrist, the person who's going to be involved in imposing or enforcing that treaty that we read about in Daniel 9.27 under a prince of Roman lineage, that that person is the same as the rider of the first horse. In other words, the individual who rides the white horse in the apocalypse. Very easy mistake to make. But actually, that's not correct. They're different individuals. They're different antichrists. Only one of the four will be possessed by Satan throughout the period of the Great Tribulation, the three and a half year Great Tribulation, and will control a global, a global government during that period, and it's that person to whom the statue, the idol, whatever it is, gets erected on the Temple Mount. And I say whatever it is, not because I don't know, I'm gonna show it to you. Uh, I do know. Uh, but at any rate, point is, um, there are different individuals. And then there's another confusion that occurs that's quite common. It's surprisingly common. Yeah, and it's because of error that's been taught in the church, uh, especially in the United States, but around the world. You know, the United States is particularly given to pre-tribulationism because this country hasn't suffered very much, even in wars. We haven't seen warfare, you know, at our doors in this country uh, for a long time. Certainly not, not like anything that you would see, such as in Ukraine or, you know, World War II or this kind of thing so far, Right? So somehow the church thinks it's special that Christians are better today than Christians of the past and they're not going to have to go through death or martyrdom or rape or torture or wounds and recovery and wounds and recovery or starvation or complete deprivation, freezing to death or just outright being murdered you know, in warfare or by some evil person, right? Or some horrible accident. All of those things happen to saints all over the world all the time, especially in Muslim countries or, or Hindu countries or some of these places where they're really into um, paganism, particularly witchcraft sometimes or, or voodoo type ritual or this kind of thing. Christians are hated and they are killed and they are martyred still. What makes Christians in this country or the West or the European Union or wherever think that somehow they're better? You know, that somehow what the Antichrist or any of the Antichrist could do to us today is worse. That it's categorically so different that we shouldn't be here. That that's somehow God's wrath rather than the enemy's evil. And that we should miss it, right? Now I could speak a lot about this from a philosophical perspective, right? But as we're going to see tonight, Scripture explicitly pinpoints these things. I don't have to rationalize, which is what I've been doing here for the last couple of minutes. There's no need for that. And when Christians and teachers, Bible teachers, so-called scholars, miss the fact that Scripture explicitly tells us about what's going to happen and when, it's because they've allowed their ears to be tickled, they've given their hearts to the desires of their flesh, which is, I don't want to suffer. You know? Uh, you know, suffering, that's God's wrath. You know, when it comes down to, yeah, you're going to kill me? Okay, no thank you. That's God's wrath. I'm not going to attribute that to the devil where it really belongs. Okay? But the thing is, Scripture also explicitly defines what is God's wrath. It's not left for us to guess. Every error that Christians make in this area of prophecy, whether it be past or future, is because they are guessing. They're divorcing their thought process from what scripture explicitly says. And they're not comparing the two when they need to do that. And then saying, okay, if there's a difference, where have I gone wrong? Where do I need to correct my thought process? Where do I need to point myself back in the right direction in what scripture actually says? They don't go that far. And the issue of the Antichrist is the same thing. And you're gonna see that as I get into this. I'm gonna give you hard evidence here to identify the Antichrist that pertain to the first four seals of the apocalypse, but they aren't the only ones. There are a lot of other antichrists, even in the world today, that aren't among the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but they operate under the antichrist, they operate under the devil just the same, okay? 
There are some specific individuals who do specific things. It's a cadence, if you will, a set of criteria, a set of steps that happened in the last days leading to Armageddon that we're supposed to be able to objectively recognize when the time comes. We weren't told these things so that we could go and then say to our brothers and sisters or to non-Christians, nobody will know. There aren't any signs. The Lord will just show up and someday, you know, the Christians will be gone. And if you're still here and your family member who said they were a Christian or your friend who said they were a Christian suddenly isn't, well, you'll know God did something. That's about as deep as the theology of a lot of Christians go. They sit here and they listen to somebody like me. Not like me, but like me. <laughs> From the pulpit, you know, they... they they hear a bunch of stuff and they say, wow, this person, they know so much about Scripture. And hey, they were able to lead me to the Lord. Yeah, you know, if this is the pastor or teacher or whomever friend who led them to the Lord, they must know that they're, you know, what they're talking about on the rest. That was my attitude. I was totally guilty of that when I became a Christian in a home church. I was led to Christ in the, in the uh, basement, the uh, built-out basement of a pastor in Colorado Springs in a home church. And he loved God. In fact, he lost his home for preaching the gospel in Colorado Springs. The city literally confiscated his home because he had neighbors complaining about the noise coming through his basement windows when he was having services Sunday mornings in his home. The city literally stole his home. But this pastor was an ardent pre-tribulationist. He separated from me from fellowship when I was no longer a pre-tribulationist after I realized what he was teaching was false. But I was so convinced that what he was saying was true, I would argue with a couple of classmates at the academy who weren't pre-tribulationists. I thought they were heretics. I was guilty of sin of some of the stuff that I condemn today. Because I know better. Now I've read scripture, right? But there's so many people like me who haven't read the scripture, or they have, and then they've allowed themselves to, be re to remain mentally or spiritually blind They've, they've made that choice, they've been engulfed in that error, and they've crossed the line into a false spirituality, right? When they think, well, I'm not going to suffer for the Lord. No, that's not me. Even if somebody comes and shoots them, though, they won't attribute that to God's wrath or think that that is not from the enemy. But if it's happening in a system, under an antichrist system, maybe that's exactly what they'll think. If they're pre-tribulationists, for example, right? They'll attribute it to God. And they'll say, why am I still here? Or, or they'll be blind instead. And I'm going to give some actual examples of this that are current, that are recent. Uh, something changed this year in the spirit. So I'm going to walk you through some, through some of my past errors. And we're going to talk about where we're at, Okay. So when the Lord first showed me in 1987 who the Antichrist was, I asked him to show me who and what was being spoken of in Revelation 13. In other words, the fourth horseman. And I didn't realize at the time that this was the fourth horseman, right? This is this weird imagery that I'm going to get to a little bit later uh, in this hour. Didn't realize that I was talking about the fourth horseman. I just read this imagery. You know, Revelation 13 doesn't exist in nature, this bizarre thing which I'll address when we get to the topic of the fourth horseman. And I said, Lord, what is this, right? You know, a lot of Christians look at that, they think it might be a chimeric hybrid, this beast with feet like a bear, body like a leopard, mouth like a lion. Doesn't exist in nature. Nobody had seen it hardly. You know, nobody could just say, hey, there it is. And so I, at that point, had concluded that God's word was literal, that he meant what he said, said what he meant. And so I'm thinking, okay, what is this? You know, is it metaphorical? Is it metaphysical? Is it some creature that some evil scientists are going to produce? You know, the next generation of Nazis are going to produce with genetic engineering or something like that. And um, at any rate, shortly after that, God showed me who that individual is. And of course, I've told it, most of you here, maybe all of you, um, who that person is. And we're going to do that again today. But this was in 1987, and so I thought, okay, now God's shown me who the Antichrist is with some real hard evidence. We can't have that long, right? Till all this stuff is fulfilled. That's what I thought. 
How long could we possibly have? He was already an adult, already popular throughout the world. Considered the most eligible bachelor in the world until he got married. Prince of Roman lineage. Everybody on the planet knew his name already. I thought, how long can we have? Right? And so in 1987, uh, toward the end of 1987, I was six months from graduating the academy and becoming a second lieutenant in the Air Force. A lot of my classmates today are full bird colonels. Uh, most of them are retired. But I have others who aren't retired. They're generals now. Some are still colonels. Uh, active duty classmates today. Friends of mine. And I chose a different path because I thought, how long can we have? I've got to quit. I need to go and work on this and write this up and get this done because we probably don't have very long. And I knew nothing about biblical chronology at that point, even less about biblical creationism, though I believe God created the heavens and the earth. I had suddenly turned young earth creationist from macroevolutionist, not based on any real knowledge, just, okay, God said it, that's good enough for me at that point. And I hadn't done the biblical chronology, didn't know that we had a timeline from Adam and Eve to the start of the millennial kingdom like I know now. But at any rate, I quit. I thought, we don't have that long. It took me 11, well, see, that was 87, so I guess, actually, yeah, 11 years, roughly, to the uh, publication of the first edition of the Antichrist and the Cup of Tea. After that, multiple, I'll call them false starts that happened, right? As I observed current events, uh, uh, the world's greatest newspaper exegete, as I observed current events, try to figure out, okay, where are we, when are we? It's not that we won't be able to do that when the time comes. Is it, we, you know, I can look back in retrospect and say, boy, we've had some false starts here that were pretty serious. You know, so when I came in 2005 and I presented these things, at that point the quartet had been formed, the roadmap looked like we were getting pretty close to that treaty of Daniel 9.27, thought, well, we probably don't have that long. We're still here, though. And those things haven't happened yet, right? So far as we know, we can't prove it. 2010, you know, I presented a very plausible scenario for the notion that the tribulation week could have already begun because of what Obama and Biden were doing in relation to the uh, fake peace process, also under Charles still, and I'll come around to that later in this presentation. But it was very plausible, you know, that we could have already been in the tribulation week at that point. We had threats already with North Korea, for example. I'd already started at that point what became the book North Korea Ran in the Coming World War that was published in 2018. So again, 11 years later, that book came out. But in 2010, I'd already been working on it, already understood who the writer of the fiery red horse was, the second seal. And in fact, I, at that point, I knew who all the writers were, of all four horses of the apocalypse, who the four horsemen are, who the, who the uh, four horses themselves are, what they look like. Already had that in 2010. And it looked like we could be heading into the tribulation week, but what was it? It was another false start. And today, and you're going to hear this from me, I'm going to present what looks like another possible scenario that we could be in the tribulation week. But I'm going to give you criteria before the day is out, to know objectively uh, if we are in the tribulation week in the not too distant future, in other words, in the near future. In other words, there are specific things that when they happen biblically, they're unmistakable, they're not ambiguous, they're not things that we can argue with once they've happened, where we will end up knowing precisely where we are and when we are. Those things haven't happened yet. In 2008, uh, and I'm going to cover this when we talk about the rider of the white horse in a moment. I'm going to dig into this. Obama and Biden had their, their Democratic National Convention in what was then in Vesco Field, uh, where the Denver Broncos play. And I was working literally blocks away from that stadium. And when it happened, and I hadn't been paying too much attention to Obama at that point, to be honest. Uh, he was a Democrat, and they're evil. Yeah, and they are. I'm not just saying that. They've become more evil since then, overtly. But when I say evil, I mean they're actual Satanists. 
They're, they're lost human beings just like every one of us, you know, before we became believers. And they're precious human beings in that regard before God, right? But what they stand for is serving Satan from start to finish today. And that really kicked into high gear with Obama and Biden. And when they had their DNC, I felt a change in the Holy Spirit, which is another reason I thought when we got to 2010 and I presented here, that, boy, maybe the tribulation week has begun. And you're going to understand uh, a little bit of why it looked like that in 2008. But in fact, a change in the spirit had occurred, and I felt it. And when I became a believer in uh, 1986 and prayed with that home church pastor to receive the Lord, I felt the Holy Spirit enter me. I've never heard another human being who's a Christian say that. I'm the only person I know in the world who's given that kind of testimony. Doesn't mean others haven't experienced it. I've just never heard another person say that in their testimony. But I physically felt the Holy Spirit enter me. And then I felt a change in the Spirit with the DNC in 2008. Then this year, in uh, just months ago, there was another change in the Spirit that I felt. Something has happened that's a big deal this year. And two things, actually. And I'm going to get into that. So without that, um, let's proceed. And I'm going to give you, particularly tonight, some means, because I don't believe I'll get to it in this first hour, by which to recognize where we are and when we are, when the time comes. In other words, is this another false start? Because I want to be clear it could be, all right? And I'm going to say some other things about the identities of these horsemen as we get into it. But I guess here's the other thing I want to say before I continue. These horsemen and the horses have all been identified at this point, so far as I am concerned. Maybe one or two of them are riding, are already riding. Maybe not. But just as I've known who the fourth horseman is since 1987, he wasn't riding all that time, even though he's been the top globalist on the planet the entire time. In other words, when these guys begin to actually ride, there are specific things that occur under them. It doesn't mean they have, been, have not been active before that. It doesn't mean they haven't been identified before that. So that's really what I want you to understand. Just because they've been identified, it doesn't mean they're already riding. But these are the people who will be. These are the nations that will be. And are represented by these symbols when the time comes in the precise sequence that we read about in Revelation 6 and, of course, elsewhere in biblical prophecy. All right, so let's proceed. Uh, flag me down if uh, I think the, and I asked Pastor Carter to do this too, if I think these slides are transitioning and they're not for you, Okay. Because what I see on the computer screen might actually be a little bit different. And uh, I'm not a whiz with this yet. <laughs> okay. And I am going to skip a lot of these slides. I'm going to stop where I want to make certain points. And I want you to pay attention to the imagery as well as I describe these things. Because I'll primarily be stopping on imagery as I make certain points. So let's see here. Do I have this on? No. There we go. Okay. And bear in mind, some of this text, if you're reading it carefully, won't pertain because uh, some things have changed since I initially wrote this. I'm going to update what I need to update as we go. All right, the first seal of the apocalypse, Revelation 6, 1 to 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as of a noise or sound or voice of thunder, Roaring, come and see. In other words, the Greek can be translated all four ways. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out victorious, and that he might be victorious, or to achieve victory, overcome, conquer. One of the things that's being promoted today on the internet by a pastor out of Australia and by some others is this notion that COVID-19 and the uh, jabs are arrows and that because it's called coronavirus it somehow relates to this crown of the first seal and they're trying to say oh okay the fulfillment of this 
seal is COVID-19 and the so-called vaccines. I want to tell you that's nonsense for multiple reasons, but a couple are that the crown that's spoken of here is Stephanus. It's a victory crown, a victor's crown, like would be given in the Greek games. Shaped like a wreath or a crown of thorns. It's that kind of a crown. Okay, it's not the same kind of crown that you think of when you hear the word corona, and it isn't that word either. It's Stephanus in the Greek. And there's no mention of arrows either in this verse. There is an allusion to arrows, and I'll come to that in Daniel 9.27. Most people don't know that. The word that's translated uh, la rabim, the Hebrew, which is with many. Uh, the word rabim has rav, or rab as its root word, and that can be translated as arrow, and rabim as arrows, besides being translated as many. And that treaty, that covenant, when the time comes, is active over that entire tribulation week. In other words, when this seal, the first horseman, actually starts to ride, there are arrows associated with it, but the arrows are in connection with the imposition or enforcement of that treaty in Daniel 9.27, starting at the beginning of that week, and not actually, as it turns out, under the rider of this seal. That activity of enforcement in Daniel 9.27 is under the Prince of Roman lineage, who is the Antichrist. So in other words, before he's riding as the fourth horseman, and we're going to come to him as the fourth horseman, even before that, he's involved in imposing or enforcing a treaty with many or with arrows, it's both those things. When we're talking about arrows, we're talking about modern weaponry, such as ballistic missiles, etc. So, he's involved in imposing or enforcing that treaty before he ever rides as the fourth horseman, before he's ever possessed by Satan on a continual basis, you know, over the three and a half year period of the Great Tribulation. Okay, but... Even when that starts, there's another Antichrist who's involved under this first seal. And it's got nothing to do with COVID or COVID-19. But I, by the way, will have a book on the depopulation agenda coming that does address a lot of areas of the globalist agenda, including how COVID-19 fits into that under the Vertold Antichrist, under Charles, as we get to it. Okay, a noise or voice, voice uh, excuse me, a noise or voice of thunder or roaring a white horse. I'm mostly going to skip past this because uh, I'll explain as we go. I want you to see the imagery. So Barack Obama, a lot of people have tried to suggest, um, particularly since 2008, that he is the Antichrist. A lot of Christians have said that. He's not the Antichrist. But as you're going to see in this presentation, he is an antichrist, and he does appear to be the rider of the white horse. He's not the one who's going to control a global government for three and a half years. So people have sensed something is up with him, and I'm going to suggest to you that that, in fact, is the case. The name Barak is translated as lightning in uh, Greek. This sort of means, well, in Hebrew, but it's used... You know, when, he, when the Lord says, I saw Satan fall like lightning... Right? The devil. In the Olivet Discourses. And, and in other, I think it was the Olivet Discourses. Don't quote me on that. Look up the passage in Scripture. But he says he saw Satan fall like lightning. The Hebrew equivalent to that, to that is Barak. It's the same name as Barack Obama for his first name. Uh, at that time, Rahm Emanuel was associated with Obama. Not just Biden. Rahm's name means thunder. Rahm Emanuel was also present at the DNC at the time in 2008. So you got lightning and thunder with the two of them. So August 28th, the DNC, there was a white horse present at that event. I'm going to show it to you. Okay. This is the mascot of the Denver Broncos to this day. It overlooks the stadium where the DNC occurred, the Democratic National Convention. The name of this horse, and it represents an Arabian horse or a Mustang, the name of it is Thunder. That's what they call it. And at the games, the pre-games, they'll do something called Rocky Mountain Thunder, where the audience is stomping their feet. And they'll actually bring out a horse, a white Arabian horse, onto the field named Thunder that this statue represents. That was present, that horse, at the DNC in 2008, not just the idol here, the statue, if you want to call it an idol. 
That overlooked the event in 2008 where the convention occurred. All kinds of interesting artwork uh, was produced and popularized on the internet and around the world for Obama in connection with those events, portraying him literally as a Messiah figure and as a godlike figure. This is one example of that. I want you to notice that he's looking upward. Pay attention to his gaze when you see photos of him. So he accepted his nomination. People were stomping their feet doing that Rocky Mountain Thunder thing. This is the 2008 DNC. And then he was saying, yes, we can. And it's not in this presentation, but that is an invocation of Satan when you play it backwards, backward masked. If you play yes, we can, and you can pull this up on the internet, just Google it. Yes, we can, play backwards and listen to it. It's basically hailing the devil. Literally, the word Satan is in that. And that was his theme for his presidential run. Yes, we can. Okay, his campaign mantra. All right, in uh, Revelation, it talks about Satan's throne in Pergamon, which is in Turkey today, right? Historically, where Satan's throne is. Pre-World War I, Germany. Uh, okay, so it is Matthew 24-7 the Lord comes back like lightning and so forth, but, okay, Luke 10, 18, let me correct myself because I got it in my slide, when he says he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, all right, so in relation to that temple at Pergamum, it represented Zeus or Jupiter, depending on whether you were talking about um, the Greeks or the Romans, the same top god as it were, the false god in their pantheon of gods represented Satan. And Satan's throne was said in Revelation to be there at Pergamon. Well, pre-World War Germany actually moved that thing to a museum in Berlin and reconstructed the buildings around that throne. And of course, who fomented World Wars I and II? Germany did after they moved that throne to Berlin from Turkey. This is uh, something Hitler used. In Germany, I want you to pay attention here to the imagery. This is the podium where Hitler would speak. Notice the uh, Roman eagles over here and the Nazi symbolism right behind. Okay, Pay attention to the layout here, 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 and then this right here. That's a mock-up, an alternate version of those buildings in the throne at Pergamum that Hitler and the Nazis used. This is where the main Nazi rallies were, were held in uh, World War II. Another view of the same thing. So again, pay attention to the layout here. You'll understand in a moment why that's significant. Hitler himself speaking, right there at that podium. You saw what was behind him and on either end, right? Democratic National Convention, 2008, in the stadium. Notice the layout. Okay, this is before he was speaking. This is just the construction of the buildings. Behind Obama and Biden at this event were Roman eagles atop the U.S. flag, atop the flagpoles, literally right behind this podium where Obama was speaking. You're going to see Obama's image on either end here, but this is a mock-up like a miniature version, a similar structure to what Hitler and the Nazis used. This is the actual DNC convention. There's the white horse, thunder, right there, top the scoreboard. Here's what I just showed you. These are the crowds at the DNC, okay? There's the podium where Obama would speak and others, and then these are the projectors over here. Behind him were U.S. flags with the uh, eagle atop them. So the eagle was a symbol that the Nazis used. It was a symbol the Romans used. Okay. Of course, it's our national symbol as well. And ties back to ancient Babylonia. All right. I'm not going to belabor this 
thing on Obama more than I have to, but there are certain things I want to cover. So again, in relation to the first seal, this has to do with La Rabim with Benny, that treaty in Daniel 9.27 under the Prince of Roman lineage, who is not Obama, not the rider of the white horse, but the, in, the imposition of the enforcement of that treaty occurs simultaneously with that rider beginning his activity going forth. And what I want to point out is arrows in this. So, uh, Barit, La Rabim, Shavua, Echad, so it's basically covenant with many, uh, one seven is what it says in the Hebrew. La Rabim, Rav is the root here, and that root, um, and I'm, I'm going to come back to this, I'll explain some of this under the fourth horseman, this, this verse and some of what's in that text in, in relation to Charles, uh, rather than just recite it here because I don't want to belabor this at the moment. But what I want to point out is the arrows here. So the root word Rav uh, from Rabim or Rabin ties in with Yitzhak Rabin who's now deceased in the past in this false treaty that was being built up under Charles. Uh, Prince Charles, now King Charles III. And in case I'm confusing anyone, we'll come back to him and why he is the Antichrist of Scripture. And uh, this thing here, Rav, is arrows or darts. It's not just, you know, when it's plural, many. It's like having a quiver of many arrows, if you want to think of it that way. But it's also speaking to individuals. So it's both things at the same time. So while the rider of the white horse has a bow, you know, as an antichrist, the antichrist, who's the one who's going to impose or enforce that treaty, he's got the arrows. Okay? That'll make more sense a little bit later. So, and then the eagle of the United States has arrows in his claw, right? And the symbolism isn't just Roman. Like I said, it goes back to Babylonian. If you were to look in Ezekiel 17 in the Old Testament in relation to Babylonia and that symbol of the eagle, it actually talks about a cropped off vine, about arrows and so forth in connection with that eagle in Ezekiel 17. So the United States has a Babylonian symbol, which the Romans also used, which Nazi Germany also used a version of it. Okay, Obama, I told you he had messianic imagery in connection with his run for president. Here it is. Notice, um, let me turn this on. <laughs> I'm inept with my pointer here. All right, notice the crown on his head. That is a Stephanus. That's a classic Stephanus right there. Another example of messianic imagery. And notice him kind of winking. Yeah, people produced all kinds of artwork like that in relation to Obama and the 2008 presidential run and so forth. All right, victory. So the rider of that horse goes forth victorious and to be victorious. Some translations say conquering and to conquer, but the real meaning is victorious. And I want to just point something out. It isn't until we get to the second seal and the second rider that peace is actually taken from the earth. People who look at this language in the first seal will often think, well, that's the start of warfare. It's the start of the awful stuff of the tribulation week, right? But in reality, the really bad warfare starts under the second seal. So whatever is happening here with this victory and being victorious, it's not actually open warfare. It's something else. It's a different kind of victory. Such as an election, for example. And I'll come back to that. Okay. I think a lot of people understand something at this point about the nature of Barack Hussein Obama. You know, he's a communist, he's a Marxist, he's a fascist. One of his favorite mentors in all the world was Saul Alinsky, who worshipped Lucifer, literally. He was a Satanist. Obama, a lot of people said, was not born in the United States. And there was some testimony to say he was actually born in Kenya by his grandmother and by others. And that his U.S. birth certificate was a fake. In fact... Obama was born in Kenya. He is a British subject. He was not legally 
uh, elected president of the United States because he was not born in the United States. And his birth certificate was a complete fraud from start to finish. The important piece of all that for our purposes is that he's a British subject. And I'll come back to that. Oh, and all the way, he, he's also a Muslim, by the way. And once in a while, he let that slip through his lips. You know, so he's an anti-Christian Muslim. He calls himself a Christian at the same time, you know, at different occasions. He didn't want the public to realize that he was actually a Muslim. So he generally lied about that, but once in a while it slipped through his lips. All right. So there's some imagery associated with Allah and with the idea of the Mahdi that was also associated with Obama in some of the artwork. And I, I suggested that you notice that he gazes upward. That's part of that imagery that you find in Muslim apocalypticism in relation to their Mahdi or their, their own counterfeit Messiah. And again, I'm going to say that person is not Obama, but he sought to portray himself in that role with that intentional upward gaze. And people feeded him in that way with this messianic artwork. And it wasn't just other people doing that. He, he made statements about himself, half-jokingly, Obama did, about being a god or a messianic-type figure and so forth. And I'll quote that when we get to it. I'll give an example. Okay. Most people recognize that Obama stands for a lot of evil things, like Biden, today. All right, victory. Um, okay, going the wrong way here, sorry. I think I am. All right. Um, the election. So Biden is on record, and Obama is on record, as Obama wanting a third term, which he can't legally have in our system as president. Obama publicly stated he would like to have a third term, but since he couldn't have that under our system, he'd be perfectly happy being the puppet master behind whoever was president and having a third term that way. In fact, we're in Obama's third term right now. A lot of people look at Biden and they say, this guy couldn't be running the show. He isn't all there. You know, he's not just an evil lunatic. He's literally not all there. And people listen to Kamala Harris. And you'll see all these comments from conservatives, uh, particularly people like Steve Bannon or whatever. And, you know, they'll talk about Kamala Harris and word salad because the things that come out of her mouth are frequently incoherent, as if she was doing drugs or had been just brainwashed five minutes earlier and her brain was scrambled and she couldn't get the words out straight. Yet another time, she sounds perfectly coherent in meetings where you see clips of her talking and so forth. And then we're stuck with that. So what's happening? Are they men trained candidates? Have they been uh, brainwashed in some sense? And I need to move faster here, so I want to get to this imagery. Okay, I have a little trouble with my direction. All right, this is Obama at a gate in Berlin, Germany. And this imagery, again, you'll notice it's got the victor's wreath in its hand right here and up there, I guess. And Obama raising his hand like Hitler. This is just outside the Pergamon Museum, where that throne is that we were talking about. Obama associating himself, in a sense, with Zeus or Jupiter in that event. Okay, the actual Pergamon Museum, the throne, the way it's laid out, you notice the similarity to what we saw Hitler using and what we saw used at the 2008 DNC. All 
Okay, here we are again, 2008. There's Obama on either end in place of the Roman eagle, for example, that Hitler used. This is the podium where Obama was speaking right here. So he's being projected on either end. And you can see the U.S. flags here in the background. It's a little hard to make out right there. But each of them had the eagle over the top of the uh, flagpole. Obama speaking. All right, the statue we saw a moment ago. This imagery is again like the all-seeing eye, Obama portraying himself with this. And you get the statue, the winged goddess. That statue's name is Victory. Victoria or Victory. So again, he's got the wreath. He's associating himself with Victory. The messianic imagery that he accepted of himself in connection with the DNC. The name Thunder. You know, like you read that, that sound of thunder, that noise of thunder with the opening of the first seal, right? And then, of course, he had a bow when he became president. meaning the U.S. military arsenal. The Nobel Committee gave Obama the Nobel Peace Prize. That's another wreath, another victor's wreath in a sense. Okay, so you just saw some evidence as to why Obama might be the rider of the white horse. But he's not in the activity yet of doing that unless the tribulation week began with Biden entering office. Now something else happened at the same time that Biden entered office, and that's the Great Reset. Most people have heard of that. It's the, I say it's the uh, actualization of the New World Order. The Great Reset is actually under Charles, the fourth horseman, the actual Antichrist of Scripture. He personally announced it from the Great, uh, excuse me, from the uh, World Economic Forum before anybody ever heard Klaus Schwab put out a book using that title or mention it himself. The phrase Build Back Better, the phrase Great Reset, both come from Charles. He personally mentioned both to the world months before anyone else ever heard others use those terms. I mention that because that was announced about the same time as Biden entering office. Obama and his people are the ones pulling the strings in the Biden administration behind the scenes. So that means Obama, Victoria Nuland, Susan Rice, some other folks associated with them. And Biden is kind of like the puppet president in front. Maybe, and again, this is hypothetical, maybe we're already in the tribulation week, maybe the Great Reset, which Charles initiated and pretty much the whole world has signed on to, because what's happening in the world, as I'm going to discuss tonight, is all being done under the Great Reset, under Charles. It's being implemented right now. Things are happening on the ground all over the planet because of it, suggesting we might already be in the tribulation week, that that might actually be the treaty that's spoken of in Daniel 9.27. I'll explain that further later. If that's true, then Biden being in office with Obama pulling the strings behind him in that circumstance is significant and would suggest that the white horse is already riding and soon we'll be seeing the activity of the second seal, the fiery red horse and its rider. Those are hypotheticals. We have to wait and see when the time comes. Who the foretold Antichrist is is not a hypothetical. It's, it's a definite and I'll be explaining that as we proceed. So I'm going to move quickly through the rest of this here this morning. So we're going to deal with three horses here. Charles is the fourth horseman. These are the, the second, the third, and the fourth. All right. Fiery red horse. Let's just read this quickly. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see, another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth. So there's peace up to that point. So under that first seal, there's still peace. To take peace from the earth. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth. And that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So three things. A fiery red horse, a rider, and a sword. Right? 
That combination piece is taken from the Earth. All right, this is Kanama or Kolima. It comes out of Asian mythology. This is from the side of a chariot, and it is a fiery red horse. It's a prominent symbol in Asian mythology. It was adopted as the national symbol of North Korea. That's the fiery red horse. They light it up at night at least once or twice a year with torches, and so it gets that fiery red background. That overlooks downtown Pyongyang, their capital. It's a Pegasus. It's the same horse as this one from Asian mythology. This is the same statue again. Notice it's black when it's not lit up. You see that? The color, it's kind of black. Let's see if I can just point that out. But it's not on their currency. It's red on, its, on their currency in other places. But the statue's black, which kind of suggests that it leads to the third horse of the apocalypse. And we'll come to that. Here it is again. All right, here's their currency. You can see the same statue with a reddish tinge. And probably if we had a perfect piece of that currency, it would look even more red. Same thing again. But they call that a fiery red horse, regardless of how they're portraying it. They call it Kolima or Kanama, and in their, myth myth their mythology, it's a fiery red horse. The United States had the Red Horse Brigades, which is this weird acronym, facing off against North Korea during the Korean War. And they were also used in Vietnam. Rapid engineering deploy, rapid engineer deployable heavy operations Repair Squadron Engineer, I can't think of a more awkward acronym than that, but, but they wanted to really emphasize this idea of the Red Horse associated with North Korea when they were facing off against North Korea. A patch used by the Red Horse, uh, these engineering folks. Okay, taking peace from the Earth, we'll come back to that. Okay, it's now Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-il's son who's in charge of North Korea. This is them with their fiery red head and smashing a U.S. Uh, military ship. That's what they're portraying. This is a Korean poster, North Korea. Then them targeting the White House with missiles, fiery red missiles. By the way, they call a lot of their armaments Kanama or Kalima. The exact same thing they call that horse. So they've got tanks, ships, missiles, etc. named after that thing. North Korea does. And that's what they're portraying here. Same thing. Now notice this. This is in the United States. This red Pegasus. This is over the Magnolia building in, uh, well, somewhere in Texas. I think it's Dallas. But over the Magnolia oil building, that symbol was adopted by Mobile Oil after Magnolia. And then Exxon Mobil today still uses it. You find it on the old um, pumps for some of these gas stations, Mobile Oil. Rex Tillerson was the CEO of ExxonMobil, and then he became Secretary of State under Trump, facing off against North Korea. So we had the fiery red horse, so did North Korea at that time. So in other words, it's associated not just with North Korea, but with oil in some fashion, with energy. Same symbol. The sword has to do, I believe, with Islam, but it also has to do with Russia. If you've ever seen the Mother uh, Russia statue, it's about twice the size of the Statue of Liberty. It's holding a giant sword in one hand for Mother Russia. But the Muslims, of course, use it, and you know they're the religion of the sword. Many people hear that phrase. This is the coat of arms of Iran with a sword in the center of it. So it's associated with Iran. Often Muslim countries will use the symbol uh, on their stuff, particularly their flag. So this is Saudi Arabia's flag. The sword again. It's the same sword, the sword of Islam. So the red horse and the sword associated with the United States, Saudi Arabia is a U.S. ally. The red horse and the sword with North Korea. North Korea and Iran are allied. And they've shared ballistic missile technology. Maybe nuclear warhead technology. Iran actually detonated its first nuclear bomb in 2008. And I document that in my book, North Korea, Iran, and the Coming World War. Why Israel and our government and other governments continue to cover for Iran or lie about that, I don't know. Maybe they think that that was a one-time thing and Iran doesn't have an arsenal. On the other hand, maybe Iran has 
built up a secret arsenal or has nuclear warheads from uh, North Korea. It's possible. And they've been present at North Korea's nuclear weapons tests, Iran has, and vice versa North Korea at Iran's ballistic missile tests for new missiles. Russia and China and Pakistan have also provided technology to both North Korea and Iran in relation to missiles and nuclear weapons. Okay, so we constantly hear bluster from uh, North Korea about eventually attacking South Korea. Ostensibly also they would go after Japan and um, Guam, where we have a major military base. North Korea has the ability at this point, and maybe Iran does too, but certainly North Korea does, along with China and Russia, to strike the United States with an EMP weapon an electromagnetic pulse weapon at altitude, which could take out our electric grid. So if they ever attack the United States directly, it will likely be an asymmetrical attack like that to try to just remove us from their war. All right, this is the cover of my book. This was published, of course, after I delivered this presentation, North Korea ran in the coming world war. You'll notice on it that I've got the United States in association with the fiery red horse, North Korea in association with it, and then, of course, the sword associated with North Korea and with the United States via Islam and Israel kind of stuck in the middle. There's a companion series called uh, Israel, quote-unquote, Peace in the Coming World War that'll be retitled, but it's the, the Middle East-centric rather than the Asian-centric piece of information in relation to all this. So that when we see, and this is the point I want you to walk away with right now, when we see the wars break out with North Korea and Iran, those will lead to World War III. But those will also signify that the activity of taking peace from the earth under that second seal of the apocalypse has begun. That we're in the events of the second seal at that point. So what we've done is we've identified the rider of the white horse probably as Barack Obama. We've identified the rider of the fiery red horse probably as North Korea's leader. And then of course somebody associated with oil in the United States will have a role to play in some fashion and facing off against North Korea. Islam and Russia will likely have a role to play in relation to that sword that pertains to the rider on both sides. And so peace gets taken from the earth. Will that happen? If we see those wars break out this year, we're already as we speak in the second year of the tribulation week right now. It's roughly a seal per year when these things get fulfilled. I'm encouraged that we haven't seen that happen so far. It's very possible this is just another false start. When we talk about the third seal, this is where the trouble really begins in that thought process. So when we get to the black horse, see what it says here? So the third seal, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold, the black horse, the one who sat on it had a pair of scales in his or her hand. It can be translated both ways in the Greek. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, or roughly a day's wage, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. That can be interpreted multiple different ways. And I'm going to suggest to you they're all true. So this thing about scales tied in with international law, lawfare, the legal system. Historically tied in in the occult with Anubis, the... the Egyptian god of the underworld, weighing the souls of the dead or their hearts to determine whether they, you know, go to hell, their equivalent of hell, or their equivalent of heaven, you know, in this pagan mythology of theirs. So it ties in with Anubis. The horse, you know, is described as black here. That's a mistranslation. It's not what the Greek says. The Greek is talking about a cerulean blue horse that has fiery red and gray and black uh, hues to it. If you look at Blucifer, what's called Blucifer, that statue outside Denver International Airport, and there's a copy of it, a miniature version of it, outside of a, of a college in Oklahoma, both centered in the U.S. breadbasket, literally, where we produce a lot of our grain. That's the precise coloration Blucifer's is of this horse. What actually makes it that horse, I believe, is that back around 2010, 
a statue of Anubis, which was big enough to mount or dismount Lucifer, had been being moved around the world, produced by a different artist, a statue of Anubis. And it was moved, the statue was, outside Denver International Airport, looking in through one of the wings there at the airport, through a glass window, it's a tall statue, as if it had just dismounted Lucifer. As if Anubis had just gotten off of this horse that matches the coloration of this, this so-called black horse under the third seal, to look in through Denver International Airport. And a lot of people look at DIA and they see from above a Nazi layout. It's laid out as a swastika, the airport is from above. And there's been a lot of very evil, satanic, New World Order type artwork in the airport over the years, including a dedication of the airport itself to the New World Order, quote unquote, by a 32nd degree Mason, Willington Webb, who used to be the mayor of Denver, you know, when the airport was constructed. So the airport is associated with Nazi imagery. It's associated with mass death or global depopulation, literally. It has this horse, which comes out of Native American mythology, actually, but precisely matches the imagery of this third seal, the coloration, that is, of the Greek text, what it means. And then Anubis was specifically and explicitly associated with this horse, this god that carries the scales, this false god of Egyptian mythology, that ties in with weighing the souls of the dead. And then there's this lawfare thing that happens. And that ties in with Israel. So... I've talked in prior presentations here about the Great Tribulation beginning as the national crucifixion of the nation of Israel, with Israel being a type of the Messiah to the other nations of the world. So Christ is crucified in the middle of the crucifixion week as the only begotten Son of God. And then in the Great tri Tribulation, the, under the fourth seal, when you get to the midpoint of the Tribulation week, the nation of Israel is successfully attacked, half of Jerusalem taken captive in war, the nation effectively murdered, if you will, before the rest of the nations of the world, killed as a national entity in a sense, scattered, buried, you know, like a new captivity, a new Babylonian captivity. So some would carry it far, carried away captive as far as Babylon and Iraq, the half of Jerusalem taken captive and so forth. But the point is, Israel's going to suffer a national crucifixion. In these events, there are certain things that tie into the temple, etc., and with Israel, there's this effort to bring the nation before the International Criminal Court, you know, and in relation to the Treaty of Rome, neither of which Israel ever signed on to. But they want to actually try Israel before the nations of the world through the ICC and find Israel guilty. And what will be the result of that? Well, even though the Palestinians so-called are a, a group of rabble, I'm going to call them, in relation to Israel in the land. They are invaders of Israel's land. They are the equivalent to Barabbas in the crucifixion week. A counterfeit son of the father. So they've got someone named Abbas leading them. Then you've got Israel under Netanyahu again. All of a sudden, he's back in power. And I have said multiple times to people over the years that it's likely in my mind that Netanyahu or someone with a name like that will be over Israel when the Great Tribulation begins because the name Netanyahu relates to Netzer, which relates to Nazareth or Nazarene. And the Nazarene was crucified, the actual son of the father, and a counterfeit son, Barabbas, was released at the midpoint of the crucifixion week. So what will happen? The world will crucify Israel, try and find Israel guilty, crucify Israel nationally, and release the so-called Palestinians under Abbas, the counterfeit son of a father. In parallel to the midpoint of the crucifixion week, when Barabbas was released, and Christ, the actual son of the father, was crucified. That ties in with this set of scales, which is why I brought all that up, the lawfare. So it's about a bunch of things at the same time. And then when it talks about oil and wine, we see the intentional collapse of the energy industry in the world today. And at some point, the world will wake up and say, we've got to protect this and prevent it from getting worse because everybody's going to starve to death and die or freeze to death or whatever if we don't get things back on track with our global energy systems. But I'm gonna share a little bit later, uh, maybe tonight, if I don't get to it now, and I don't think we'll get to it now, so probably tonight, how this is all being done intentionally under Charles. But the point is, the writer of the third seal appears to be a spirit rather than a person, necessarily. It's this spirit of Anubis, and what Anubis represents is pagan, satanic stuff. It's a demonic kind of a spirit. But the horse exists, 
the statue of Anubis exists, the actual imagery exists. It ties in with Lucifer and Anubis. And again, these, these images are in the midst of the U.S. breadbasket, in the case of the third seal. Ties in with the, the idea of grain becoming very expensive. But we can see other reasons why that would happen in the world today with what's happening in Ukraine and Russia and so forth. And all that stuff, by the way, with Ukraine and Russia is being orchestrated out of the United Kingdom. Obama and Biden fomented with Victoria Nuland a coup regime in Ukraine in 2014. They took what was a friendly government to Russia and turned it into a friendly government to the West and an anti-Russian type regime in a sense, but also because they wanted to change the morality over there, just like they want to do in Russia. They don't like the fact that Russia rejects sexual Satanism, like the LGBTQ plus whatever movement. They got Ukraine to embrace that. They put a friendly regime to the, to the U.S. and U.S. sexual Satanism in Ukraine. Russia couldn't tolerate that because that violates a lot of agreements that the United States and NATO made with Russia with the fall of the Soviet Union, and, and Russia felt genuinely threatened and does feel genuinely threatened. And so... There was an opportunity in the February, April time frame this year to stop the Ukraine war. The UK intervened and prevented it from being stopped. And then more recently, there was an opportunity for Germany and other nations in Europe to say, you know, we've had enough of this to their leaders. We don't want to freeze to death this winter or see our industry shut down or be at without work or begin to starve because energy's become so ridiculously expensive with this war that's been fomented in Ukraine and continues to go on and on and on. Maybe we'll go and get you know, gas from Russia again like before and just say, you know, forget this stuff of these sanctions. Well, the UK and the United States being aware, of course, that talk like that was actually happening behind the scenes in Germany and in some other places, blew up the Nord Stream pipelines. The UK did it. Russia has flagged the UK. It appears Poland and the US were involved. Certainly the US gave the go-ahead to the UK to do that. There are other gas pipelines coming into Europe that are keeping them afloat right now. Will Russia target and take those out? It's a real possibility because Russia has promised payback at this point to the UK in kind. We haven't seen the payback yet. It's already going to be a tough, tough situation for Europe this winter. Could get a whole lot worse quickly. So are we in the tribulation week yet? Don't know. We'll find out soon enough. But my point in going through all of this is, all over the world, they're talking about famine next year. In 2023, tens of millions of people potentially starving to death, maybe hundreds of millions, already. And that's without seeing things collapse further than they already have. That's with the lack of production of food that's already occurred this year. It takes about a year, typically, for the food to actually show up at the grocery stores from when it's produced. So all the stuff that's not getting grown this year around the world, you know, the reduction in food because of the lack of fertilizer, because of the lack of exports of just grain and fertilizer from Ukraine and to an extent Russia, that won't be felt till 2023. Could get a whole lot worse quickly though for 2024 and beyond. And so that's the point that I wanna give you right now. In other words, it all lines up with the idea that we could already be in the tribulation week. The fact that the world's talking about global famine next year, the fact that we're on edge right now with war, with North Korea and Iran, maybe with Russia and China. Now, I mentioned in my book, North Korea, Iran, and the Coming World War, that and it could happen the opposite of this. This is the scenario I proposed. It could happen in the opposite sequence. What I proposed was that North Korea um, would attack South Korea, and Iran and Israel go to bats, and that would be enough of a distraction for the United States and NATO to where China and Russia would take advantage of the situation. Russia go beyond just Ukraine and invade Europe, and China finally go after Taiwan. And all of a sudden, we're in World War III. And then we'd likely see things flare up between Pakistan and India, right? And they're both nuclear-armed adversaries. And suddenly, we're in World War III. The entire breadbasket of the world at that point is threatened because the other major grain producers lie between India, China, and Russia. 
and the United States. So that being said, the opposite can occur. You know, we've already seen Russia go into Ukraine. They've, they're kind of stopped right where they are right now. They haven't gone after the rest of Europe yet. But we're heading down that scenario I laid out in the book. The next thing could be either South Korea being attacked by North Korea or could be China going after Taiwan. And what's typically being said, you know, what's typically recognized in military circles is that China is usually years ahead of what they say is going to happen in a given time frame that they lay out. So they've got a time frame for their so-called reunification with Taiwan. It's about five years from now. There are top officers in the United States currently who are saying, okay, we think that probably means China's going after Taiwan this year. About five years ahead of time, which seems to be typical for them, at doing things in advance of when they say they're going to have it achieved, the Communist Party. Will that happen? We don't know. But if we do see that happen this year, I would expect simultaneously with that, right before it or right after it, we'll see all these other things transpire in sequence, and all of a sudden we'll be in World War III whenever this stuff gets triggered. And at that point, we are under the events of the second seal. We are already in the tribulation week. We will see global famine like the world hasn't seen before right after that in the following year, and then we will see the great tribulation start. And Charles will then do his thing as the fourth horseman. So I'll focus on the fourth horseman and other things tonight. I believe I've used up my hour here. We'll get to um, these things and looks like, okay, there we go. I'll just show you this. We'll talk about this. That fourth horseman is pale green gray in scripture. And I want you to notice the coloration here um, of this unicorn. When you look at the cover of my book, The Antichrist and a Cup of Tea, because of the method used to print it, you don't see this greenish hue on the unicorn on the cover of the printed book because of the CMYK colors that are used to print the cover. But if you were to see it in RGB, which is a more complete color spectrum, the green hue is extremely obvious. And the actual coloration of this horse in the fourth seal is pale green gray or the color of rotting, rotting human flesh, basically. And that happens to be the precise coloration of the unicorn on Charles' coat of arms. So that's one little piece of the imagery and the evidence to suggest that he's the Antichrist. We'll cover it all briefly tonight. And then I'll talk about um, some other things about where we are in the world and what's changed with him being king of England. It doesn't change the fact that he's the Antichrist. Of course, Pastor Carter was very instrumental in pointing that out clearly to me this year, but... It doesn't change that, and uh, in fact, he's got some power and some wealth and other things at his disposal now that he didn't previously have. So that's it for this first part. We'll get into it further tonight. Please write down your questions if you have them, because you'll have an opportunity, I think, at some point to ask questions uh, of all of us here today. Thank you.